Chapter 43 from MedSurge Timby, Caring for Clients with Ear Disorders. List types of hearing impairment and acuity levels for each. Describe techniques used by hearing impaired clients to communicate with others. Give examples of support services available for the hearing impaired. Discuss the role of the nurse in caring for clients with a hearing loss. Name conditions that involve the external ear. Explain the technique for straightening the ear canal of adults to facilitate inspection and the administration of medication. Discuss methods for preventing or treating disorders of the external ear. Name conditions that affect the middle ear. Describe nursing interventions appropriate for managing the care of a client with ear surgery. Discuss the nursing management of clients experiencing vertigo. Explain the symptoms clients have when diagnosed with Meniere's disease. Hearing impairment. Ear disorders occur throughout the life cycle. Many ear disorders result in hearing loss, a common sensory deficit among older adults. Hearing aids can compensate for some but not all forms of hearing loss. Nurses play a pivotal role in preventing hearing loss by reducing the severity and frequency of ear infections among children and advocating for measures that reduce exposure to loud noise. In addition to hearing loss, some ear disorders cause clients to have problems with balance. Depending on the nature of the disorder, there are various treatment options. Nurses are also key to assessing and evaluating clients with balance disorders and to promote the safety of these clients. Hearing is a sensory function that involves sound transmission, sensory receptors, and neural pathways. Hearing loss has many causes and implications for quality of life. Pathophysiology and etiology. Hearing impairment is described as mild, moderate, severe, or profound, depending on the intensity of sound required for a person to hear it. See table 43-1. Diminished hearing results from conductive loss, sensory neural loss, mixed hearing loss, or central hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss occurs from obstructions in the outer or middle ear, such as an accumulation of cerumen or wax in the external acoustic meatus or diseases such as failure of the tiny ear bones to vibrate. Sensoro-neural hearing loss involves damage to the inner ear from conditions that affect the sensory hair cells or the nerves. Etiologies include atherosclerosis, tumors of the vestibulocochlear nerve, infections, and drug toxicity. A mixed hearing loss involves both conductive and sensoro-neural problems involving damage within the outer or middle ear and in the inner ear or auditory nerve. Central hearing loss involves injury or damage to the nerves or the nuclei of the central nervous system. Presbycusis is hearing impairment that is associated with old age. Clients with a hearing impairment often have tinnitus in which the client hears buzzing, whistling, or ringing noises in one or both ears. Box 43.1 elaborates on causes of conductive and sensoroneural hearing loss. Hearing loss also can result from a repeated exposure to excessive noise, such as live concerts, high volumes from stereos or headphones, or a loud work environment, machinery, or jackhammers. Risks for hearing loss include the following. Family history of sensoroneural impairment, congenital malformations of the cranial structure of the ear, use of ototoxic medications such as gentamicin and loop diuretics, recurrent ear infections, bacterial meningitis, chronic exposure to loud noises, perforation of the tympanic membrane. Also see evidence-based practice 43-1. Hearing loss seriously impairs the ability to protect oneself and communicate with others. The age at which hearing loss occurs plus the severity of the impairment have extensive consequences. For example, hearing loss during the first three years of age, the most critical period for learning to make sounds, affects language acquisition at the word, phrase, and sentence levels. If uncorrected, hearing deficits can lead to depression and social isolation. Approximately 15% of adults in the U.S. report some difficulty with hearing, with men more often than women reporting hearing issues. As people age from 45 years old and on, hearing impairment increases from 2% of adults to nearly 50% of adults aged 75 years or over. The National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders estimates that nearly 15% of adults between the ages of 20 and 69 ex years experience high-frequency hearing loss because of exposure to noise during work or leisure activities. 
Box 431, Common Causes of Conductive and Sensoro-Neural Hearing Loss. Conductive Hearing Loss. External Ear Conditions. Impacted Wax or Foreign Body, Otitis Externa. Middle Ear Conditions such as Trauma, Otitis Media, Acute and with Effusion. Otosclerosis and Tumors. Sensoro-Neural Hearing Loss causes Trauma, Head Injury, Noise, central nervous system infections such as men meningitis, degenerative conditions, prob proboscis, vascular conditions, atherosclerosis, sudden deafness, ototoxic drugs such as aminoglycosides, salicylates, and loop diuretics, tumors, acoustic neuroma, meningioma, metastatic tumors, idiopathic is Meniere's disease. Mixed conductive and sensoroneural hearing loss, middle ear conditions, otosclerosis, temporal bone fractures. Table 43.1, hearing acuity, hearing range, the decibels needed to hear the most quiet sounds in the better ear. Normal is 0 to 25, mild impairment is 25 to 40 decibels, moderate impairment is 40 to 70 decibels, severe impairment is 70 to 95 decibels, profound impairment is 95 to 120 decibels, and total deafness is more than 120 decibels. For more information, see detail on page 742. Assessment findings. Early detection of hearing loss can be beneficial to managing and treating what has caused the hearing loss and or managing the consequence of the hearing impairment. Clients need an otoscopic examination to, deter to determine if there are underlying issues such as impacted wax or injury to the tympanic membrane. Hearing tests will include audiometry and tuning fork tests. The client's history for exposure to occupational or other noise may be significant as well as family history. Medical management. Besides treating the cause of the hearing loss, medical management includes a recommendation for a hearing aid, a battery operated device that fits behind the ear, in the ear, or in the ear canal and amplifies sound. Clients with a conductive hearing loss benefit more from the use of a hearing aid because the structures that convert sound into energy and facilitate perception of sound in the brain continue to function. Hearing aids amplify sounds but do not improve a client's ability to distinguish words or speech. In addition, all sounds are amplified, including background noise. Clients who use hearing aids are challenged with some related problems. Some experience a whistling noise because of a poor fit or improper function. Others may not have the appropriate hearing aid for their hearing loss. Hearing aids can also malfunction in terms of the on-off switch, batteries, or other issues. It is important that clients seek assistance when they have hearing aid problems. Client and Family Teaching 43.1 provides tips for hearing aid care. The nurse emphasizes the following points when teaching the client. Keep the hearing aid away from heat and moisture. Ear molds may be washed with soap and water after being removed from the hearing aid. They must be dried carefully with a small air dryer such as those used to blow dust off keyboards. Carefully follow the manufacturer's directions for cleaning the hearing aid. Speak with a health care provider about having one of the staff keep the ears clean with the ear lavage as wax can cause damage to hearing aids. The use of cotton swabs is not advisable as they just push the wax deeper into the auditory canal. Many hearing aids companies provide a wax guard that fits over the hearing aid and prevents ceramin from getting in the hearing aid. Call your health care provider if ear drainage develops as this can damage the hearing aid and may indicate an infection. Turn hearing aids off when not in use. Replace dead batteries as needed. Anticipate when the battery needs to be replaced based on a personal record of usage and battery life. Make sure that the battery is placed correctly. If positioned backward, it will not function. Keep the hearing aid and batteries in a location that is not accessible to children or pets. Other issues that can occur include ear discomfort related to a poorly fitting ear mold or hearing aid, jaw movement that impacts the hearing aid, improper placement of the ear mold or hearing aid, contact the audiologist or technical specialist if this problem persists. Acoustic feedback or hearing aid squeal or whistling, although this is a normal occurrence if it interferes with hearing or is not usual, contact the audiologist or technical spe specialist for assistance. Malfunction of the hearing aid requires assistance from the hearing or technical specialist.
Some clients hearing deficits learn American Sign Language, a method for communication that uses a hand-spelled alphabet and word symbols. See figure 710 in chapter 7. Clients also learn speech reading, also called lip reading. Many technological devices have been developed to promote communication. The Federal Communications Commission rules for television closed captioning assure that hearing impaired people have full access to television programming. This entails accurate, synchronous, and complete display of words and sounds without impeding the visual content of the program. Frequency modulation, FM systems, use radio frequency to amplify sounds. There is a transmitter microphone used by the speaker, such as in a classroom or church, and a receiver used by the hearing impaired person. The receiver can be connected to a hearing aid device or be part of a headset. Many facilities, such as schools, churches, and theaters, provide FMs, but people can also get personal FMs. Other types of hearing assistive technology systems, HATS, which is uh, abbreviated for American Speech Language Hearing Association, include infrared systems, infrared light waves transmit sound from the television, can be used in homes and theaters or classrooms. Induction loop systems. This system works with a client's hearing aid. An induction loop is installed in the ceiling or floor and connects with the speaker's microphone. The client turns the hearing aid to the T telecoil telephone and the hearing aid telecoil receives the electromagnetic signal. The client can adjust the volume via the hearing aid. One-to-one -one communicators. In some situations, clients want to hear one person easily in a setting when there is extraneous noise. The client gives a person a microphone and the sound is amplified directly into the client's hearing aid. The client can adjust the volume. Other hearing aid uh, equipment, telephone amplifying services for all types of telephones, text-based telecommunication devices for the deaf, amplified answering machines, text message telephones, teleprinter or teletypewriter, amplified telephones with different frequency responses, specialized doorbells, computers with specialized additions. Many other products allow the hearing impaired to perceive rather than hear sound. For example, light activated alarms and smoke detectors, alarm clocks, doorbells, and telephones flash when sound is produced. Hearing dogs, such as guide dogs for the blind, are specially trained to warn their owners when certain sounds occur. Surgical management. Since Sensoroneural hearing loss is usually irreversible. For the client who is profoundly deaf or has severe hearing loss and for whom a hearing aid is ineffective, a cochlear implant may be beneficial. This device has an external microphone that captures incoming sounds as well as an external sound processor implanted behind the ear that captures the sound, converts it to digital signals, and sends them to an internal implant. This internal processor converts the signals into electrical energy and stimulates the auditory nerve. The brain then perceives this as sound. See figure 43-1 on page 744. A cochlear implant does not restore normal hearing, and what a person hears through a cochlear implant is not the same as the amplified sounds he or she hears through a hearing aid. However, the cochlear implant does provide a means for clients to learn or relearn sounds in the environment and to understand speech. Other implanted hearing devices may also be used. One type is a bone conduction device known as the bone anchored hearing aid. It is used as an alternative for clients who have mixed and, condu and conductive hearing loss or single sided hearing loss. The device is implanted in a post auricular position under the skin into the skull. An external apparatus is then worn above the ear to transmit the sound through the skin. Although there are issues related to skin infections and the loss of the implantable device as a result of trauma, there is a much improved sound quality for hearing impaired clients. There is considerable innovation potential for other bone conduction devices with implanted transducers. One such device is middle ear implantation in which the device is implanted in the middle ear cavity. Other devices in various stages of development are implanted through dental attachments. Nursing management. The nurse observes for signs of hearing impairment, such as leaning forward, turning and cupping the ear to hear better, and asking that words be repeated. See box 43.2. He or she assesses gross hearing using the techniques described earlier as described in chapter 41. The nurse also determines the clarity of the client's speech and may recommend a referral for the diagnosis and subsequent treatment of a hearing impairment as well as speech therapy. 
Many people reject the idea that their hearing is impaired. Some consider it a sign of aging and deterioration. If the client fears that wearing a hearing aid is a stigma, the nurse describes the various types of hearing aids that are available, some of which fit almost unnoticeably in the ear. See figure 43-2. The nurse also stresses the importance of avoiding the purchase of a hearing aid from a mail order catalog or a company salesperson. Suspiciousness. A nurse should be able to distinguish between suspiciousness and insecurity. For instance, if a client expresses fear that others are talking about him or her, it is a sign of suspiciousness and may indicate that the client may have a hearing impairment. Insecurity, on the other hand, is a lack of self-confidence. Gerontologic consideration. Unfamiliar environments may contribute to disorientation or confusion in the older adult with hearing impairment. Nursing interventions should include speaking clearly in a low to tone of normal volume during frequent orientations and teaching related to assistive hearing devices. Soft consonant sounds such as beginning and ending consonants should be clearly articulated and the nurse should face the client if possible. The client's ability to care for the assistive device will influence selection of a hearing aid from various styles available. Bucks. 43.2, client symptoms of hearing loss. Words and other sounds are muffled. Difficulty understanding conversations, especially if there's other noise, such as at a social gathering, public meeting, or other situations with background noise. Some clients avoid these situations, resulting in decreased socialization. Inability to hear complete words, particularly consonants. Request for frequent repetition during a conversation. Increased volume on televisions, radios, and other devices sense that hearing problems are interfering with normal activities. Friends and colleagues report that the client's speech has deteriorated and the client is less understandable. If a hearing impairment exists, the nurse obtains information about its severity and the methods used to understand the speech of others. When a client hears poorly, the nurse determines the communication method the client prefers, speech, reading, signing, writing, or typing. Suggestions for oral communication are listed in Nursing Guidelines 43-1. If the client uses a hearing aid, the nurse safeguards the instrument, assists the client with its insertion, and helps maintain its function. To protect their self-esteem, some clients with a hearing impairment nod their heads as if they are following the conversation or laugh along with others to conceal the fact that they do not understand what has been said. The nurse encourages clients with a hearing loss to be forthright and inform others about the hearing deficit. In addition, he or she identifies assistive hearing devices and aids for communication discussed earlier. The nurse advises clients to maintain previously established relationships because a physical impairment is unlikely to affect genuine friendships. The nurse uses illustrations, pamphlets, and written directions to aid teaching and includes a family member. He or she asks the client to repeat the information and demonstrate technical skills. The nurse initiates a referral to a community agency to evaluate if and how well the client is performing self-care after discharge. Hearing loss. Eliminate background noise as much as possible. Stand or sit on the side of the client's better ear. Ensure that there is adequate natural or artificial light. Get the client's attention. Face the client. Speak clearly and at a normal pace without exaggerating pronunciations. Do not shout, but avoid dropping conversational volume at the end of a sentence. In review, American Sign Language can be used, speech reading, closed caption, headset with amplification, TDD, TTY, hearing assistant dogs, and support person who can communicate by signing. Nursing role. Eliminate background noise, stand or sit on the side of the client's ear, use good light, get the person's attention, speak clearly, do not shout, be positive, and provide paper and pencil for the client. Impacted cerumen or wax, pathophysiology and etiology. It interferes with sound carried on airwaves. Assessment findings, otalgia, diminished hearing, orange-brown accumulation of cerumen, medical management, hydration, irrigation, and removal using a cerumen spoon, nursing management, includes reporting any uh, accumulation that cannot be removed, also getting an order for irrigation, also having your patient cleanse, cleanse their ears daily with a warm washcloth, teach them also to not use q-tips or anything sharp, um, and to report any 
problems and consequences for follow-up exam by the physician. Is the following true or false? Impacted cerumen interferes with sound carried on airwaves. True, impacted cerumen interferes with sound carried on airwaves. Foreign objects, pathophysiology and etiology. Foreign objects find their way into the ear either by accident or by deliberate insertion. Sharp objects can scratch the skin or cause blunt penetration of the tympanic membrane. Insect stings cause local inflammation of the tissue. Assessment findings. The client describes discomfort, diminished hearing, feeling movement, or hearing a buzzing sound. On gross inspection, there is evidence of abrasion from trauma or an insect or an object is seen. Inspection with a pen light or otoscope reveals swelling and redness in the auditory canal. Medical management. Mineral oil is instilled in the ear to smother an insect. Solid objects are removed with small forceps. Nursing management. The nurse instructs clients to clean the ears with a face cloth rather than inserting objects into the ears. A hat with ear flaps or a scarf is recommended when venturing into the woods or other areas with a high insect population. Otitis externa. Otitis externa is an inflammation of the tissue in the external auditory canal. Pathophysiology and etiology. Inflammation is usually caused by an overgrowth of pathogens such as Staphylococcus aureus or Pseudomonas or fungus such as Aspergillus. The microorganisms tend to follow trauma to the lining of the ear or their growth is supported by retained moisture from swimming called swimmer's ear. Another possibility is that a hair follicle becomes infected causing a furuncle or an abscess to develop. Skin conditions such as psoriasis or eczema can also lead to otitis externa. Seborrheic dermatitis or allergies to hair products that cause dermatitis skin inflammation can lead to otitis externa. Assessment findings. The tissue in the external ear looks red. Sometimes it is difficult to see the tympanic membrane because of swelling. Clients describe discomfort that increases with manipulation during the examination. Hearing is reduced because of swelling. In severe infections, a fever develops and the lymph nodes behind the ear enlarge. Otoscopic examination reveals diffuse or confined inflammation, swelling, and pus. A culture of drainage identifies the specific pathogen. Medical management. Treatment includes warm soaks, analgesics, and antibiotic ear medication, often with corticosteroid medication, such as neomycin, polymyxin, hydrocortisone, OTIC, OTIC solution. Brand names, cortic cortico cortisporin and otocort. Nursing management. The nurse instructs the client to carry out the medical treatment and provides health teaching to prevent recurrence. For example, he or she advises swimmers to wear soft plastic earplugs to prevent trapping water in the ear. If chewing produces or potentiates discomfort, the nurse encourages the client to temporarily eat soft foods or consume nourishing liquids. Above all, the nurse advises the client to avoid the use of non-prescription remedies unless they have been approved by the physician and to contact the physician if symptoms are not relieved in a few days. Box 43.3. Preventing recurrent otitis externa. Do not use cotton swabs or other objects such as hairpins, matchsticks, or keys that can cause trauma to the external auditory canal. Avoid swimming in polluted water. Dry the outer ear and external auditory canal after the ears are immersed in water. A blow dryer on a low setting is usually effective. Washing ears with alkaline soap may leave a residue that interferes with the acidic pH of the ear canal increasing the possibility of an infection. Instill eardrops with a 2 to 1 ratio of 70% isopropyl alcohol and acetic acid to dry the ears and restore the acidic pH of the auditory canal. Acetic acid is vinegar. Earplugs may or may not be recommended. Some healthcare providers feel they cause trauma to the external auditory canal. If used, they need to be cleansed with isopropyl alcohol. Otitis media, disorders of the middle ear. Otitis media is an acute inflammation or infection in the middle ear. Clients may have acute or chronic forms of either serous otitis media, also known as secretory or non-separative otitis media, or the purulent or suppurative type. Although otitis media is more common in young, among young children, adults can and do develop middle ear infections. Pathophysiology and etiology. Cirrus otitis media, a collection of pathogen-free fluid 
behind the tympanic membrane results from irritation associated with respiratory allergies and enlarged adenoids. Purulent otitis media usually results from the spread of microorganisms from the eustachian tube to the middle ear during upper respiratory infections. Typical pathogens that cause otitis media include streptococcus, pneumonia, and haemophilus influenza. Adults generally experience otitis media unilaterally on one side. When fluid or pus collects in the middle ear, pressure increases and causes pain. This causes the tympanic membrane to bulge with the potential of a spontaneous rupture in some cases. Rupture results in a jagged tear of tissue that heals slowly and sometimes incompletely. Scarring interferes with the vibration of the tympanic membrane, causing diminished hearing. Clients with perforated tympanic membranes are prone to repeated infections. Other potentially serious complications can occur. Because the middle ear connects with the mastoid process, a part of the temporal bone, pathogens that are unresponsive to antibiotic therapy can spread, causing mastoiditis, or they can travel deeper in the inner ear, causing labyrinthitis. Infection may also extend to the meninges, causing menin meningitis or brain abscess may result from its extension to the brain. If septicemia occurs, the infection can spread to the large veins at the base of the brain and cause lateral sinus thrombosis. Facial nerve damage and facial paralysis may result from the infection. With prompt and adequate treatment, complications are rare. Assessment findings. The client often describes a history of having had a recent upper respiratory infection or seasonal allergies. Signs and symptoms vary widely depending on the type and severity of the inflammation, but may include a fever, tinnitus, malaise, severe headache, and diminished hearing. Tenderness behind the ear indicates, indicates mastoiditis. The tympanic membrane looks red and bulging. Pressure in the middle ear or dysfunction of inner ear structures can cause nausea, vomiting, and dizziness. If the tympanic membrane perforates, fluid drains into the external acoustic canal and pain is relieved. The white blood cell count shows an elevated number of neutrophils and eosinophils. If the tympanic membrane has ruptured and drainage is present, the cultured drainage reveals a specific infectious microorganism. Medical and surgical management. Prompt treatment usually prevents rupture of the tympanic membrane. In some cases, fluid is aspirated by needle. Antibiotics are given to control the infection. The overuse of antibiotics, however, has created another problem. Microorganisms are becoming resistant, and for some infections, the available antibiotics are of limited benefit. To reduce the consequences of spontaneous rupture of the tympanic membrane, subsequent scarring, and hearing loss, the physician performs a meringeotomy, or tympanotomy, an incisional opening of the tympanic membrane. The incised opening facilitates drainage of the purulent material, eases the pressure, and relieves the throbbing pain. The incision heals readily and with little scarring. Plastic surgery, meringeoplasty, is usually successful in repairing the perforated tympanic membrane. In one technique, the edges of the perforation are cauterized and a patch of blood-soaked, absorbable gelatin sponge, gel foam, is used as scaffolding over which new tissue grows until it has filled in the defect. Chronic infections are prevented if the tympanic membrane is repaired. In the case of mastoiditis, a mastoidectomy is performed to remove the diseased tissue. With early and effective antibiotic therapy, mastoiditis is rare. Nursing management. After meringeotomy, the discharge from the ear is bloody and then purulent. To remove the drainage, the nurse wipes the external ear repeatedly with a dry sterile cotton applicator. An alternative is to insert a loose, not tightly packed cotton pledgette in the external ear to collect drainage. The nurse changes the cotton when it becomes moist. Otosclerosis. Otosclerosis is the result of a bony overgrowth of the stapes and a common cause of hearing impairment among adults. Fixation of the stapes occurs gradually over many years. Pathophysiology and etiology. The underlying cause of otosclerosis is unknown. The condition, which is more common in women than in men, usually becomes apparent in the second and third decades of life. It seems to be accelerated, accelerated during pregnancy. Most clients have a family history of the disease, which indicates a possible hereditary relationship. Otosclerosis interferes with the vibration of the stapes and the transmission of sound to the inner ear. Although hearing loss in otosclerosis is of the conductive type, when and if progression of the disease involving the cochlea of the inner ear occurs, a mixed type of hearing loss develops.
Assessment findings. Signs and symptoms. A progressive bilateral loss of hearing is the most characteristic symptom. The client notices the hearing loss when it begins to interfere with the ability to follow conversation. There is particular difficult to hearing others when they speak in soft, low tones, but hearing is adequate when the sound is loud enough. Tinnitus appears as the loss of hearing progresses. It is especially noticeable at night when surroundings are quiet and can be quite distressing to the client. The tympanic membrane appears pinkish-orange from structural changes in the middle ear. When the Rhine test is performed, the sound is heard best when the tuning fork is applied behind the ear. The sound lateralizes to the more affected ear when the Weber test is performed. Diagnostic findings. Audiometric tests reveal the type and severity of hearing loss. A CT scan demonstrates the location and extent of excessive bone growth. Medical and surgical management. Although otosclerosis has no cure, a hearing aid helps. The level of restored hearing depends greatly on the severity of the sensoroneural involvement. The outcome is best when the hearing loss is purely conductive. If the surgical treatment is selected, a stapedectomy is performed on the ear most affected. In this procedure, all or part of the stapes is removed and a prosthesis is inserted that can vibrate the oval window. See figure 43.3. Once the stapes is free to replace, the client experiences an immediate dramatic improvement in hearing. Hearing temporarily dis diminishes after surgery because of swelling, but eventually returns. Complications include dislodgement of the prosthesis and continued hearing loss, infection, dizziness, and facial nerve damage. Depending on the outcome of surgery, the procedure may be repeated for the opposite ear. Nursing management. The nurse uses selective alternatives for communicating with the client as identified earlier in Nursing Guidelines 43.1. It's important to give the preoperative client an explanation of what to expect in the immediate postoperative period. The nurse tells the client that activity is restricted for 24 hours or more after surgery and that hearing may be temporarily the same or worse than before surgery. After surgery, the nurse positions the client on the non-operative side. He or she takes care to prevent dislodgement of the prosthesis as a result of coughing, sneezing, or vomiting. Nausea and dizziness are common problems. The nurse assesses, assesses facial nerve function by checking symmetry when the client smiles or frowns. Nursing diagnosis, planning, and interventions. Impaired comfort, pain, nausea, dizziness related to tissue disruption. Expected outcome. Client will experience relief of discomfort to at least a tolerable level. Administer prescribed analgesic and assess again in 30 minutes. Give an anti-emetic for nausea or vomiting. Validate client's feelings of discomfort. Provide small frequent sips of fluid or light food. Doing so prevents nausea. Limit head movement and avoid jarring the bed. Movement aggravates dizziness. Limiting movement minimizes pain, dizziness, and nausea. Risk for infection related to impaired tissue integrity secondary to the surgical incision. Client will remain free of a secondary infection. Adhere strictly to aseptic principles when changing a dressing or cleaning the ear. Administer prescribed antibiotics. Instruct client to keep his or her hands away from the dressing or packing. Keep external ear and surrounding skin meticulously clean and free of purulent drainage. Client and family teaching 43.2, the client with a stapedectomy. The nurse teaches the client and family members to refrain from blowing the nose because this action can dislodge the prosthesis, avoid high altitudes or flying, refrain from lifting heavy objects, straining when defecating or bending over at the waist. These activities increase pressure in the middle ear. Prevent water from getting in the ear. Avoid swimming, showering, and washing the hair until approved by the physician. Follow the physician's instructions for keeping the ear clean. Stay away from people with respiratory infections. If a head cold occurs, contact the physician immediately. Notify the physician immediately if severe pain, excessive drainage, a sudden loss of hearing, or a fever occurs. Adhere to the above restriction of activities recommended by the surgeon until told otherwise. Normal activities can be usually resumed within two to four weeks. Risk for injury related to dizziness. Client will be free of injury. Encourage client to use the side rails and handrails when preparing to ambulate. 
Walk with the client who is dizzy. Evaluation of expected outcomes. The client remains comfortable as evidenced by minimal complaints of pain and no complaints of nausea. He or she has no signs or symptoms of infection. The client experiences mild dizziness but maintains safety. The prescribed medical regimen and restrictions are discussed with the client or a family member. Client and family teaching 43-2 reviews other teaching points important to include in a discharge plan. Disorders of the inner ear. Vertigo. Vertigo is the sensation of movement when there is none or a sense of exaggerated motion when moving. The inner ear contains the semicircular canals and otolithic organs which sense the body's motion. Signals are quickly sent from the inner ear to muscles of the eyes, trunk, neck, and limbs so that stability can be maintained. When a disturbance occurs in the inner ear, vertigo occurs, along with problems with balance and stability. Vertigo is not a disease, but a symptom of a disease. There are two types of vertigo. Objective vertigo, in which a person is stationary and the environment is moving, a sensation of things moving around oneself, and subjective vertigo, when a person feels motion, but the surrounding environment is stationary, a spinning sensation. Syncopal episodes are usually indicative of cardiovascular disease and are not generally diagnosed as vertigo. People experiencing vertigo are most likely to have a peripheral vestibular disorder, such as benign, paroxysmal, positional vertigo, and Meniere's disease. Treatment of vertigo is based on the cause. Refer to drug therapy table 43.1 for medications used to treat or manage symptoms related to vertigo. Nursing care focuses on the treatment of symptoms and maintenance of the client's safety. See concept care map 43-1. Motion sickness is a form of physiologic vertigo. Repeated and constant motion causes this disturbance. Clients are most likely to experience motion sickness while in a car or plane, on a boat, or on carnival rides. Symptoms include nausea and vomiting, preceded by pallor and diaphoresis. Clients may use over-the-counter antihistamines such as Dramamine or Meclizine hydrochloride, which is antivert, to prevent nausea and vomiting related to motion sickness. Anticholinergic agents such as scopolamine patches are used to block the histamine response. Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo involves brief periods of severe vertigo when clients move their heads, particularly if they move their head back and toward the affected ear. Many clients experience it when they roll over in bed onto their side. This is the major cause of pathologic vertigo affecting clients after the age of 40 years. Causes of this disorder are related to debris in the semicircular canals resulting from structural damage caused by infection, head trauma, or other events. Meclizine may be used for a period of one to two weeks to treat the vertigo. If the vertigo persists, clients may engage in vestibular rehabilitation therapy, which is an intense physical therapy program designed to strengthen the vestibular sensory system and restore a client's balance. Planning care for clients with vertigo requires careful assessment of symptoms. If the client has any chronic issues related to the vertigo, such as impaired fluid balance related to nausea and vomiting, or inability to manage activities of daily living because of the unpredictability of the vertigo and fear of injury, nursing care focuses on what type of vertigo the client has and or the cause of the vertigo. In addition, treatment related to the vertigo and the client's ability to manage the issues caused by the vertigo are essential to providing appropriate care to the client. Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease, also referred to as endolymphatic high drops, is a disorder characterized by fluctuations in the fluid volume and pressure in the endolymphatic sac of the inner ear. This disorder causes distension of the endolymphatic compartment, leading to a classic triad of symptoms, which includes hearing loss, vertigo, and tinnitus. Generally, Meniere's disease affects only one ear, but it can affect both. Pathophysiology and etiology. Meniere's disease most likely involves a primary lesion in the endolymphatic sac where filtration and excretion of the fluids of the inner ear occur. 
The bony labyrinth protects the delicate membranous inner ear and the membranous labyrinth of, is fluid filled. The pathology associated with this appears to include the following mechanisms. Increased production of endolymph, decreased production of perilymph, compensatory increase in the volume of the endolymphatic sac, decreased absorption of endolymph resulting from a malfunction of the endolymphatic sac or blockage of the endolymphatic pathways. Clients with Meniere's disease experience fluctuating periods of tinnitus, sensation of ear fullness, and severe vertigo. When a person moves his or her head, the endolymph also moves. Nerve receptors within the membranous labyrinth send signals to the brain about the movement. In Meniere's disease, an increase in endolymph carries the membranous labyrinth to dilate like a balloon, causes it, referred to as endolymphatic hydrops. The drainage system, or endolymphatic duct, becomes blocked. The blockage sometimes results from scar tissue or congenital narrowing of the duct. Eventually, hair cells in the inner ear are destroyed, which leads to functional deafness. In addition, the inner ear structures are disrupted and distorted, leading to chronic problems with imbalance and unsteadiness, even when clients are not experiencing attacks. Meniere's disease typically is unilateral, appears during middle age, and occurs with equal frequency in men and women. When the fluid accumulates, it dilates the cochlear duct, which diminishes hearing. It also affects equilibrium as the vestibular system becomes damaged and tinnitus occurs. At times, the client is symptom-free except for permanent residual hearing loss as the number of attacks increase. Occasionally, clients recover spontaneously. The cause of Meniere's disease is not known. Generally, physicians attribute the disease to viral infections of the inner ear, a head injury, hereditary factors, or allergic reactions. Approximately half of clients diagnosed with Meniere's disease report a family history of the disease. More recent theories about its etiology center on autoimmune factors. Assessment findings. Onset of Meniere's disease may be sudden and symptoms may occur daily or infrequently. Vertigo is the most incapacitating symptom. Clients report whirling dizziness and the need to lie down. Severe vertigo causes nausea and vomiting. Typically, clients also experience tinnitus and hearing loss that last for several hours, as well as headaches and abdominal discomfort. Nystagmus of the eyes may result from an imbalance in vestibular control of eye movement. Generally, hearing returns between attacks, but gradually becomes worse with repeated attacks. An attack lasts from a few minutes to weeks. Because episodes can be unexpected, some clients are reluctant to leave their homes for fear they will have an attack in public. Continued employment becomes impossible for some clients. In addition to a thorough medical history and physical exam, clients should have hearing and balance tests. Tests that measure inner ear function include the following. Video nystagmography, VNG, evaluates balance and eye movement by introducing warm and cool water and air and or air into the auditory canal. Involuntary eye movements are measured in response to this stimulation through specialized video goggles. Sensors for balance in the inner ear send signals to the oculomotor muscles. For clients with Meniere's disease, they cannot maintain focus on an object while having this stimuli. Their eye movement demonstrates this phenomenon. Rotary chair testing measures inner ear function. The client sits in a computer-controlled rotating chair and eye movement is measured. Vestibular evoked myogenic potentials testing determines if specific inner ear structures, the saccule, inferior vestibular nerve, and their central brain connections are working normally. The saccule has slight sound sensitivity, which can be measured and recorded when sounds are presented to the ear. Posturography determines issues of balance related to vision, inner ear function, or sensation from skin, muscles, tendons, or joints. The client wearing a safety harness stands barefoot on a platform and maintains or tries to balance while being exposed to various conditions. Video head impulse test measures eye reactions to abrupt movements by having the client focus on a specific point while his or her head is turned abruptly. If the client cannot maintain focus, it is considered an abnormal response. CT scan or MRI rules out other possible causes of the symptoms, such as tumor that involves the vestibular cochlear nerve. Audiometry identifies the type and magnitude of the hearing deficit. Electrocochleography records the electrical activity of the inner ear in response to sound and helps to confirm the diagnosis. Medical and surgical management. Treatment aims at reducing fluid production in the inner ear, facilitating its drainage, 
and treating the symptoms that accompany the attack. A low sodium, 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams per day or less, lessens edema. Smoking is contraindicated to prevent vasoconstriction, which interferes with fluid drainage. Treatment of the allergy or avoidance of the allergen is recommended. Bed rest may be necessary during acute attacks. Specific drug therapy may be include the following. Meclizine, trade name Antivert, an antihistamine often prescribed because it suppresses the vestibular system. Diazepam, Valium, or other tranquilizers may be ordered for acute episodes to help control vertigo, used only for short-term therapy because of the addictive potential. Promethazine, called Phenergan by trade, or other antiemetics ordered to help control nausea and vomiting also has antihistamine effect. Hydrochlorothiazide or other diuretics may decrease the fluid in the endolymphatic system and relieve symptoms. Dietary management is also advocated as an adjunct to other therapies. Clients on potassium wasting diuretics are advised to eat foods that contain potassium such as bananas, tomatoes, and citrus fruits. Other guidelines include the following. Limit foods high in salt and sugar. Be aware of hidden salts and sugar in foods. Eat meals and snacks and take fluids at regular intervals to maintain hydration. Drink sufficient fluids and select water, milk, and low sugar juices. Limit coffee, tea, and soft drinks. Caffeine has a diuretic effect and as such is not recommended. Eat fresh fruits, vegetables, and whole grains and avoid or limit intake of processed foods, especially those with high sodium content. Limit alcohol intake. Avoid monosodium monosodium glutamate, MSG, which can exacerbate symptoms. Avoid aspirin and aspirin products, which can increase tinnitus and vertigo. If clients become extremely incapacitated, surgery becomes an option. Surgeries range from decompression of the endolymphatic sac to insertion of intralogic catheters to vestibular nerve sections. Box 43.4 presents a brief description of specific surgical procedures. Nursing management. The nurse obtains a history of symptoms, their duration, and complete medical drug and allergy histories. He or she assesses gross hearing and performs the Ryan and Weber tests. It's also important to determine the extent and effect of the client's disability. The client with Meniere's disease requires a great deal of emotional support because of the unpredictability of the attacks and resulting impairments. During an attack, the nurse administers prescribed drugs, limits movement, and promotes the client's safety. He or she assists the client with activities of daily living because the least amount of motion can produce severe vertigo. The nurse is available, empathetic, and responsive to the client. Trust and confidence develop when the client does not feel abandoned or required to convince caregivers of the necessity for attention. Clients are comforted when the nurse acknowledges that dealing with temporary or permanent hearing loss is a challenge. If a low-sodium diet is recommended, the dietitian provides a list of foods to avoid or a specific diet to follow. If an allergy is suspected as the cause of the disorder, the nurse advises the client to take the prescribed antihistamines as directed and to avoid known allergens. If a hearing aid is recommended, the nurse refers the client to an audiologist for instructions on its use and care. Procedures to reduce severe vertigo in clients with Meniere's disease. Inner ear chemical infusions. The process for infusion includes injecting the selected drug through the tympanic membrane. The medication passes into the inner ear. Dexamethasone, a steroid, is the drug used most commonly. The mechanism of action is not fully understood, but its anti-inflammatory properties are considered to be the primary factor. Most clients get relief from the vertigo attacks, and some also get improvement in their hearing. If this does not work, then gentamicin, an antibiotic, is used as the second stage. It is generally used for clients who already have hearing loss because it is ototoxic and it increases the possibility of further hearing loss. Endolymphatic sac decompression. This procedure involves opening the mastoid and decompressing the lymphatic sac and shaving some bone from the top of the sac. A shunt may be inserted to drain the inner ear. Hearing, although not improved, is preserved. The majority of clients experience relief from vertigo and also have a reduced sensation of fullness in the affected ear. Vestibular neurectomy. The vestibular nerve is cut, preventing the brain from receiving input from the semicircular canals. This procedure has a high success rate in relieving vertigo as well as preserving hearing. Some clients continue to experience imbalance issues. Labyrinthectomy. Clients with poor hearing in the affected ear may have this procedure done in order to relieve severe vertigo. 
The balance and hearing mechanisms are destroyed on one side by excising the labyrinth and resecting the vestibular nerve. Potential complications include facial nerve injury and total hearing loss. Selected autotoxic drugs, box 43-5. Antibiotics, amacacin, azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, clarithromycin, erythromycin, gentamicin, impenem with celastin, canamycin, levofloxacin, menocycline, neomycin, alpha Alfloxacin, polymyxin B, streptomycin, tetracyclines, tobramycin, vancomycin. Antimalarials, chlor chloroquine, mefloquine, and quinine. Antifungals, amphoticin and fluctoacin, and I'll spell those, E-M-P-H-O-T-E-R-I-C-I-N and F-L-U-C-T-O-S-I-N-E. Antivirals, gank Ganclosvir, ribavirin and interferon, antihypertensive, bisoprotolol, metoprolol, ramipril, sodalol, diuretics used in antihypertensive treatment, acetazolamide, bu bumetanide, furosemide, anti-inflammatory agents, aspirin and other salicylates, salicylates diclofenic, ibuprofen, indomethacin, ketorolac, naproxen, or naproxen, Solendac. Anti-cancer, there is the following statement, true or false. Meniere's disease is a result of changes of fluid volume within the labyrinth. True, Meniere's disease is a result of changes of fluid volume with, within the labyrinth. Nursing management, meclizine, diazepam, this is review, promethazine, hydrochlorothiazide, dietary considerations, limit alcohol, avoid aspirin and aspirin products. Which medications should a patient with Meniere's disease avoid? Meclizine, aspirin, diazepam, hydrochlorothiazide. The answer is aspirin. A patient with Meniere's disease should avoid aspirin. Meclizine, diazepam, and hydrochlorothiazide are medications frequently prescribed for the patient. This is the end of the slideshow.